Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, beginning with verse 21. We found in your pew Bibles in the New Testament on page 20. Here now this continuing conversation between Jesus and his disciples about forgiveness. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God bless to us the reading of God's holy word. So we all do it, right? We all keep score. My brother's been keeping that score for a long, long time. Anybody who follows sports pays attention to the score, right? To who won the game. But for the life of me, why certain sports are scored in certain ways is totally confusing. I mean, of course, there's football and baseball and basketball and soccer where the team with the most points wins. And then there's this game with this little white ball called golf. And you're supposed to have a lower score than anybody else in order to win. And then there are some oddities in the scorekeeping thing like tennis. Anybody figure out that whole tennis thing where love equals zero? And then there's 15, 30, 40, advantage, game, set, match. It baffles me. Or what about bowling? You know, where you, you, you count pins, right? And, but then there's spares and strikes and turkeys. Turkeys, that makes no sense to me. Turkey, three strikes in a row. Well, thank goodness that bowling alleys all have automated scorekeeping machines these days. I would never get through that. And then don't even get me started on card games, poker, pinochle, Bridge, Somerset. Do you know that one, Somerset? Oh, some of you do. Yeah, my family likes that Somerset game. It's a card game with just fractions on it. And it's totally confusing to me as well. Now, children are all really good at keeping score, especially when it comes time to count the gifts under the tree and make sure they're exactly the same amount for them as there are for their siblings, right? Guilty is charged, guilty is charged. Later in life, adult children keep score based on how much things cost. And politicians, they're really, really good at keeping score too. You know, you do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. And politicians 
never forget. Our text today for Matthew's Gospel shows us Peter, who wants to know the rules when it comes to keeping score on forgiveness, while Jesus tells a parable or a story about extravagant mercy, a story that explodes all our human understanding of what forgiveness truly means. Now remember this conversation between Jesus and Peter about forgiveness and the story that he tells them about the king who forgave the debt of a slave follows on the heels of Jesus' teaching about communal discipline and sin. Peter asked, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Question mark. And then before Jesus can even chime in, he says, as many as seven times? Now, this seems like a reasonable question, followed up by another reasonable response, seven times. Peter, though, just wants some clarification about the rules. He just wants to define what are the boundaries on this forgiveness thing. And by suggesting the number seven, he is using a holy number in the Bible, one that means complete or perfect, and is likely asking Jesus if he must also practice perfect forgiveness. But by even suggesting that number seven, Peter understands that forgiveness is to be at the heart of the Christian community. But rather than offer words of praise for Peter's question and his apparent understanding of what forgiveness means, Jesus raises the bar and says, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Jesus just put this huge exclamation point on the topic of forgiveness and said to Peter that his forgiveness must be beyond perfect. It is to be unlimited, not just in principle, but also in practice. Now this forgiveness thing really gets difficult. Jill Duffold comments on this text saying, quote, Jesus refuses to free us from the obligation to be in community with one another. He basically says to Peter, there is no limit. 77 is a metaphor for infinity. 77 is code for don't keep score. 77 is a way of reminding Peter and all of us, forgive as you have been forgiven, and you likely don't want to calculate that amount. You can't calculate that amount. Following Jesus' exhortation on forgiveness, he tells this kingdom parable, a story about an extremely generous master and an unforgiving servant that serves as a warning to those who might think that forgiveness is possible on limited terms. The servant in the story is apparently a, a manager or CFO of the master's vast wealth and holdings. Stanley Saunders comments that in the Mediterranean economy, the goal was to pass a steady, acceptable flow of wealth further up the pyramid while retaining as much as one could get away with for oneself to be used to grease one's own way further up the pyramid. Apparently, this servant may have taken advantage of that system, may have taken too large a share for himself, and is now brought before the master for a reckoning of those accounts. The amount of the debt owed, 10,000 talents, is absurdly large. In the Greek, 10,000, and talent, when combined, serve as the largest possible number, representing in the story an impossible amount of money for the servant to pay. Just to put this in perspective, for a common day laborer, 
This amount would equal a day's wages for the next 150,000 years. 150,000 years. It is an absurdly large amount. The servant falls on his knees and pleads for mercy, making a promise he knows he can never fulfill. The master, moved with pity for the servant, offers a stupendous act of mercy and forgives the absurdly large amount of debt that he owes. This act, of course, would have implications for the other servants in the master's debt, essentially inaugurating a path forward for them for financial amnesty and for everyone else in his debt. Having experienced such extravagant forgiveness, you might think that the servant would be able to translate that gift of mercy into additional acts of mercy and forgiveness. But unfortunately, that is not the case, as he throws a fellow servant who owed him money into jail. Clearly, the forgiven servant uses his own forgiveness as a license to execute merciless judgment upon others, revealing his total lack of gratitude. Given the absence of forgiveness on the servant's part, his master rescinds his previous action and hands the ungrateful servant over for punishment. Clearly, it matters a great deal to God how we treat one another, especially within the community of faith. We, who have been granted grace and mercy and forgiveness, are expected No, we're required to extend grace and mercy to others, not just seven times, but every time. This text, this conversation about forgiveness and this parable essentially calls all of us to a new way of being church. At the very heart of who we are and whose we are is the mandate to build up the community of faith with a practice of love and forgiveness. This is not to be a one and done deal, but an ongoing activity, a never ending practice that is based in God's love and forgiveness offered to us. We are reminded of this every time we recite the Lord's Prayer that God's forgiveness somehow, to some extent, depends on our own ability to forgive. Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. We are reminded that as Christians who live under God's grace and forgiveness, we will be judged by this same God, mostly by whether or not we have shown grace and forgiveness to others. There's this little story that comes from uh, church council records in 16th century Switzerland, where a man was asked to repeat the Lord's Prayer, and he pretended that he did not know it. When asked why he didn't say the prayer, he said, because I know that if I say it, I would have to forgive the merchant who cheated me, and that is something I have no intention of doing. As sisters and brothers in Christ, we have already experienced the incalculable forgiveness of God, called into a new way of being, being vessels of God's love and forgiveness poured out upon others, even as difficult as that it sometimes can be. Michael Ball, in his book, The Foolish Foolish Risks of God, shares this little story about love and forgiveness. A boy who came from a Christian home had offended his parents during Advent with a rather spectacular offense. He was asked to apologize, but refused. And the more his parents gently asked, the more stubborn about it he became. Christmas came nearer and nearer, and as far as the boy was concerned, he didn't care if his presence and celebrations on Christmas Day were sacrificed. He was not going to apologize. 
Eventually, the great day arrived, and far from there being no gifts, there were bigger and better ones than usual. His parents reckoned that the more willful he had become, the more the display of their love and forgiveness was required. Immediately, there was the the collapse of his willfulness and his tears of repentance flowed. Thanks be to God for the gift of extravagant and excessive forgiveness that transforms and renews all of us. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for the transforming gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross that we might be forgiven, that we might have life abundant. Thank you, O Lord, for transforming your community and call us each and every day to the spirit of love and forgiveness that you offer us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.